No camera today, friends. As this is a podcast interview, I was honoured to do with Professor Joseph Shaw, who is a member of the philosophy faculty at Oxford University in England. He is also, in my view, a dynamic defender of the Catholic faith in England. I will also add that Dr. Shaw seems to me a lucid voice of sanity and reason in a world going slowly mad. Indeed, I fear that certain circles of Catholic traditionalism sometimes get swept up in today's mad world, or at least they may not always be thinking things through with sufficient care and nuance. This is not meant as criticism. It happens to the best of us in a world that is increasingly hyper-stimulated. At any rate, Dr. Shaw strikes me as someone who can keep his head, someone who is a very careful, sober thinker with penetrating insights into modern culture. Now, this is only the first part of my conversation with Dr. Shaw. The second part should appear soon, and he and I have further instalments planned after that, all of which, again, is a very great honour for me. Anyway, here we go. Here is the podcast. Hello and welcome to the Iota Unum podcasts from the Latin Mass Society. In the company of some great friends of tradition from around the world, we will be drilling into some of the fundamental issues affecting us today in the church and the world. Hello and welcome to the Latin Mass Society's latest Iota Unum podcast. Today, I, Joseph Shaw, am joined by the Catholic writer, Roger Buck. Roger has written three books with Angelico Press, The Gentle Traditionist, The Gentle Traditionist Returns, and Cor Jesu Sacratissimum, From Secularism and the New Age to Christendom Renewed. Roger is a convert to the faith from the New Age. Uh, Roger was born in California, um, to a British family and returned to Britain in his youth and found his way into New Age circles from a not particularly um, observant um, Protestant background. Um, we'll come more to Roger's je uh, faith journey as we go through the podcast. My first question for Roger to jump in straight into this enormous topic is about the new age. The new age is something which we are all dimly aware of, or perhaps more than dimly aware of, um, in the vast amounts of psychobabble uh, which surround us about the importance of meditation, about finding yourself and letting go of inhibitions and preconceptions. You want to find that stuff, look at any Disney film made in the last 20 years, nearly all pop music, and you can also find it in school and corporate mindfulness sessions um, and things like that. It's actually invading our uh, even commercial spaces. It clearly comes from the many faceted New Age movement. So the first question is, is this serious? How seriously should we be taking this stuff? Yes, Joseph, I think it's very, very serious indeed. And it's interesting that you just use the word that we're all dimly aware of it. Um, from my perspective, um, our awareness of it is not anywhere near serious enough. I see an enormous phenomenon here. And sometimes I confess I do get a little bit frustrated with how little awareness there is of it um, in Catholic circles. It often seems that Protestants actually are writing more books about this uh, than Catholics are. There are some good Catholic works out there, admittedly, but something enormous is happening here. Now, to be fair, to be fair to, to Catholics who are only dimly aware of it, um, I think that my life has positioned me in quite a unique way um, because I've been involved in some way or another with the New Age for 40 years now. 
Um, you know, so I've been observing the phenomenon for 40 years. So 40 years ago, um, I first got involved in the New Age around 1979, 1980, when I was 15, 16. And the New Age was a very low, low key thing then. You know, you didn't find these books in, in mainstream bookshops. Back then, when I was into this, you know, I had to go and search out specialist bookshops. You didn't find these blockbuster movies. You didn't find, um, you know, talk show hosts like Oprah Winfrey. Um, and I gather, I'm not in America now, but I gather that a lot of American talk shows have this kind of spirituality in, in there. Um, it's, I've watched this enormous change. So as I say, I've been involved for something like 40 years, uh, just to make that clear, the first, roughly the first 20 years of that, I was involved very much as a passionate advocate of the new age. Um, and then for the last 20 years, since I converted to the faith in the year 2000, by the grace of God, I've been trying to understand just what on earth happened to me, like trying to disentangle myself from this. What is the new age? What did it, why does it have this hold on people? So I've, I've done a lot of research. I've done a lot of thinking about this. It's, it's a huge part of my life, as I say, but from that perspective, because I watched it grow, it seems to me that we're, we're really not aware and um, or not nowhere near aware enough. And I'm going to say something which might seem hyperbolic to some people. It might seem overblown. But, you know, I really wonder if we're looking at something that has at least some kind of analogy to a second reformation. And it took a while for the church to really wake up to the original Reformation, um, how serious it was, it took a few decades. Um, and I do wonder if something like that is going on now, because if you look at the dominant culture, at least the dominant culture in the Anglo-American world, um, something I might say about myself is I've spent a few years living in, in other countries, France, Spain, Germany, Switzerland, um, the New Age has not saturated um, the, those countries, particularly the Catholic countries in Europe or the culturally Catholic countries in Europe, the way it has the Anglo-American world. The New Age strikes me as above all an Anglo-American phenomenon, um, maybe most of all actually an American phenomenon if we're honest, although it certainly has um, powerful roots in Britain as well. Um, but now, you know, it's really something that is hugely part of American popular culture. Um, you know, so, you know, for example, I just watched this. I, I'm, I forced myself to watch something. It was quite tough. But there's this Marvel comic superhero film called Doctor Strange. And it's basically filled with new age ideas. It had something like a hundred and sixty five million dollar budget go into that. Needless to say, Hollywood is not putting $165 billion budgets into Christian films. It's putting it into films like this, you know, or The Matrix, or, you know, there's, there's any number of examples. Um, there, there are forces trying to make this kind of spirituality um, the dominant force in, as I say, especially, I think, American culture. And... Um, Maybe, yeah, just to come back to my perspective. Um, when I was, uh, you know, getting into the new age, age 16, 17, 1980, all of this would have been, you could say, beyond my wildest dreams. I would have never have thought that I would see a film like The Matrix or I would see a film like Doctor Strange. I wouldn't think that I could go into mainstream bookshops and just find row after row after row of new age bestsellers. It, I've watched this, it didn't exist back then. Um, and, and that's why I can see that this, this is really taking over. So yes, I am concerned that many Catholics are too um, dimly aware of this. I'm very, very grateful, Joseph, that you are very aware of it. I'm also very grateful for your kind words for me at the opening and about my books. Um, yeah, I, I, maybe I'll pause there and see if you have any more to say about the new age or what, what your observations you've been doing some work with it i know well i i well thank you very much i i 
I have, in fact, um, I wrote a, a, a what we call a position paper for the FIUV. Um, in fact, Roger very kindly helped me with it. Um, about the new age, about the traditional mass is appeal to the new age because uh, um, Roger, Roger likes traditional mass and we found another a number of, of, of other uh, personal connections. And there's a, anyway, people can go and read that. It's, it's on the FIUV website and it's now forms a chapter in, in my book, um, Case for Restoration, the Total Restoration. Um, but um, it's, it's there's, a, there's a curious thing about the, the new age. One can, one can people dismiss it and, um, and in a way they're not wrong to dismiss it because it's, 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 it's not right, it's not correct. But on the other hand, um, what we have to be aware of, however dismissive we want to be, is, is how, how saturated ordinary things have become by the new age. So, you know, Roger, you've just mentioned, you know, the film The Matrix. Everyone knows The Matrix. It's become a cult film. Um, not necessarily because of its, well, indeed, it's, it, it, it's the cult, the, the new age aspect is something that people, in a way, they wouldn't notice, but it's not that they haven't noticed it, it's that they don't label it as new age. And it's the same with the Star Wars franchise. You know, the original Star Wars films, and to a large extent, the, the, the more recent ones, it's very, very new age. And the way the Star Wars is, is more obvious. And the Matrix, though, I remember thinking about the Matrix because I, I watched the Matrix rather late in the day um, because everyone was sort of still talking about it 20 years later, or however long it was. Um, and it suddenly occurred to me that this thing that that we're all in this in this illusion, the world, it's, a, it's an Eastern mystical conception. Yes. Um, and the fact that they've got this kind of serious kind of eastern mystical thing actually is one of the things that gives it a bit of conceptual oomph you know a bit of coherence um it's a bit like i mean i, I gather that joseph campbell's um work had influence on, on people writing books because it kind of gives it a structure joseph campbell has this theory about how all mythologies have a sort of similar kind of structure um and it, it's and it, and and it does it gives it a kind of backbone and structure and, and, and a kind of coherence and and actually it's like I say it's quite quite a convenient thing for for <laughs> filmmakers writers of novels and things you can put this in um the other thing that occurs to me is that for a lot of people when we talk about spirituality it's it's a new age type of spirituality which comes first of all into their minds genuine spirituality is they think about and then their mind fills with images of um you know, meditation, uh, non-violence, yeah. um, uh, tolerance um, of, of seeing beyond the outward um, and, and seeing inward and those things. Um, there's nothing necessarily wrong with any of the things I've just mentioned, but just the package of those things together is something which is, from a new age, stable. It's yeah. not the image of a Christian monk um, or nun. Um, it's not the image of, of the, the Desert Fathers. Um, it, it's it's it hasn't come from that stable. It's come from the new age one. So it's this. It, now, now this would be different for Catholic. You said to a Catholic, you know, what do you think about spirituality? I hope they would have a, you know a, a specifically Catholic conception of it. But there's a there's a real danger because this is so pervasive in the ordinary culture that we get drawn in to that as well uh, without realizing it, without putting a label on it. So I think putting a label on it is 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 very valuable. But while we put the label on it, we need to understand what, what the phenomenon is. And this, of course, is difficult because it's an amorphous, vast, many, many tentacled, many faceted uh, phenomenon. And not even all the people who, who talk about it want to use the term new age. Um, we'll have to because we've got to call it something. Um, but Roger, how can we approach, I mean, if not giving it a kind of precise scientific definition, but just a... A, a helpful, briefish description of it, so that we know that we're talking about something rather than nothing. Yes. Okay, Joseph. Yes, you you made some very good points there. It is notoriously difficult to define, and you know part of that really is that new agers don't want to be called new agers anymore. You know, when I was starting out in the movement, you know, forty years ago, there were all kinds of people that proclaimed the new age and said. I'm happy to be a new, you know, identify with, I'm happy to identify with the new age idea. Uh, they were proud of it, but it somehow became flaky in their minds or they got embarrassed with it. So now it's called things like holistic or 
mind, body, spirit, and it shifts and it changes. But I think to give you, give a sort of starting idea of what I mean by new age that really speaks to the core of this movement is this idea that you have these days that you can be spiritual, but not religious. There's even like an acronym for it now, S-B-N-R, spiritual, but not religious. And again, you know, I grew up in a sort of still Christian America in the 60s or 70s. Nobody back then spoke about being spiritual, but not religious. This is an idea that has come out of the new age. Now, I need to be clear here. Um, I'm not saying that everyone who says I'm spiritual, but not religious, is automatically a new ager, because lots of people say this in a kind of bland you know, way. It's an easy thing to say. But there is a core of people out there that is really very serious about being spiritual, but not religious. They are antipathetic to religion. They really believe that it's useless. And they are seriously interested in being spiritual. And what, you know, so that they, they really have serious spiritual practices, you know, maybe morning meditation. They go on spiritual retreats that are not like Buddhist retreats or Christian retreats. They're, they're retreats where you have some teacher who's claiming to be spiritual, but not religious. <laughs> they, they read a certain kind of literature. Um, so so this, this is really, like as I see it, a very core idea of the new age. But then it begs the question, what do we mean by spiritual? Um, and I'm going to try to sort of suggest in broad strokes what they mean by it. What they mean by it is that they believe, people of this orientation, is that there is one universal spirituality or one generic spirituality um, uh, behind everything, that religion is just like a facade. Um, I'll just I'll give you a little anecdote. Um, long ago, I had a, a friend, um, very sincere, idealistic, a, a, you know, decent, good person. And many new, new ages are, you know, just very decent, good people. I want to really come back to that. But um, we were talking about this, and she gave me this kind of image. She said something to this effect. Well, Roger, um, I'm, I'm, religions to me are like, shop front windows or window dressing. So, you know, I look in one shop front window and there's a Catholic um, shop or there's a Buddhist shop or there's an Islamic shop or a voodoo shop. I mean, she may, I can't remember all of her words exactly, of course, but I'm not interested in the window dressing. I'm interested in the one universal spirituality in the shop. That's what's important. And this to me, seems like the most dangerous and saddening idea of um, the new age. It's, it's arguably the most toxic idea there is. So whereas lots of people would be getting you know, upset and obviously very rightly concerned about wacky new age things, you know, like channeling, you know, spiritual entities or even extraterrestrials, or they might laugh about crystals or have genuine concerns about, you know, certain Eastern systems like yoga and Reiki and so on and so forth. All of those are genuine concerns. But what I am more concerned about is the way this New Age ideology absolutely negates Christianity right from the beginning, right there, because right there, Joseph, you, you know, when you just say that Catholicism is like window dressing, you know, for the one universal spirituality, um, you know, nothing that we're doing is important. The, the wonderful work you're doing with the Latin mass, absolutely unimportant. It's just window dressing, you know, for the one universal spirituality. Um, and this, this really gravely concerns me. It's like, I actually see something very, very tragic going on here. Um, and that's really the terms that I want to speak about this. It's like, it might be very easy for many people to get up in arms about the new age and attack it. And there's a lot of 
too much of that on on the website on on, you know, on the internet you know these days what what i really want to say is that i find this very very saddening that people are being robbed blind um you know by this idea that there is just this one universal spirituality and it really doesn't matter what we do i mean another basic idea here is that there's all like this one mountain and we're all climbing it it doesn't matter if you climb it by the buddhist route doesn't matter if you climb it by a voodoo route we're all going to get to the top of the mountain that this idea this idea is the essence of the new age but as i say the people who truly take it seriously and live by it not just the people who you know say it off the top of their heads this idea of let's be seriously spiritual but not religious uh, anyway, I wonder what you have think of that. Yeah, thank. You. That's that's it's extremely interesting uh, at a, at a number of levels. I one thing I I think you're absolutely right. We we we've got to when we engage personally with people who are influenced by the new age or advocate the new age, we we've got to treat them with charity and recognize, as you say, that they've been robbed. And it's it's very often, of course, it's 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 not their fault at all. I very often that these are people who, who 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 were never given it in the in the first place, who haven't lost it in the sense that you know they weren't brought up with it. Um, but even if they were brought up with 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 nominal Catholicism, um, then there was obviously something something missing, and now they've lost it even more. They've lost the sacramental life. Um, but it's it's uh, the other aspect of it is is that is the conceptual. Um, picture here, which is which is um, the claim that you can you can look down as if from a great height on the world's religions, belief systems, and say, oh yes, they don't realise it themselves, but they're all they're all heading in the same direction, or, or fundamentally they're all the same, or the, the differences aren't important, or um, and. I mean, it's it's profoundly patronising, actually, uh, to say to a Buddhist and a, a Hindu and a, 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 a you know a Muslim, um, oh oh, you you know your differences aren't important. Well, what? It's not for me to tell them that their differences are not, not important. Um, but it's people are encouraged to think along these lines by the desire for harmony. I think that the idea that the only way to live in peace with other people is to deny the differences. I think, they, I mean, this is profoundly, profoundly wrong. I mean, there's the, in the Middle Ages, uh, people sometimes say, oh, well, the church was universal in the Middle Ages in the way it isn't actually. In some ways, it was the reverse. In the Middle Ages, a huge diversity of notably liturgy, different liturgy in, in, in a different village for one reason or another. You know, you go over the border from one diocese to another in France, you might well have a different liturgy. Um, and they had this phrase, diversa non adversa. Um, you can have diversity without adversity, without conflict. Um, if you respect each other's traditions, in the, there's this attitude though today that the only way of respecting other people's traditions is to deny that the differences are significant or real. And I think this is, uh, as, a, as, a, as a conservative Christian, uh, as people think of me, you know, people outside the church, they look at me, so there goes a conservative Christian. And I know that I have a great deal in common with, you know, the Muslim, you know, the, 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 the stereotypical Muslim taxi driver. Um, with my um, Orthodox Jewish friends, with you know, with people living in I don't know, perhaps even the the jungles of South America. I want another one of these podcasts is about is is about the the Amazonian um, type of spirituality, with which the Catholic Church has a great deal in common. It's not because I don't think there's any differences. It's because of fundamentally, uh, there's a there's a kind of commonality of um, the way we approach. And in a funny way, what I have in common with those different faith traditions is exactly what the New Agers would describe as window dressing. 
because it's it's a concern for ritual it's a concern for tradition it's a concern for spiritual discipline and it's a and all those this as a kind of way of getting in touch with um, a god who is other um and so on i can go along for, for hours talking about what we have in common. And I know it's different though, because I'm not going to turn around and say, oh yes, well, of course, there's no real difference. No, no, fundamental, huge differences of theology. I mean, there's, there's no getting away from the fact that, that, you know, my Muslim taxi driver friends, you know, although they have very much the same in- attitude as me, for example, to family life, as I, as I discover when I have my chats with them, you know, and they've got eight children and so on. And they, they don't believe in the Trinity, and that is terribly important. I'm not going to brush that on the carpet. Um, but it's it's the New Age is going to put it the other way around in an effort to make us harmonious and deny. They say, oh, oh, the, 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 the difference between having and denying the Trinity is window dressing. Um, and the, and the, the, <laughs> um, the, the difference between, but and, and the spiritual discipline is window dressing. Um, and what you really have in common is actually something all of us me you know the muslim the orthodox jew um you know the, the chap in 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 um in the amazon we would all actually deny yeah. which is oh well there's all just one we're all just one yeah. and there aren't any differences well actually that's one thing we all agree about yeah. <laughs> we do agree about that <laughs> and we all say it's wrong <laughs> yes, so yes. it's a kind of strange strange paradox but it's 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 given um political importance by the desire for harmony, but they're going around this harmony in a very strange way, ignoring the real similarities between religions and inventing similarities, which just aren't there at all. And it's, it's, it's a very curious thing um, about the modern response to pluralism um, and diversity. I, people often say, oh yes, well, it's a kind of modern thing, this pluralism, nonsense. Absolute nonsense. You know, go to the go to the Habsburg Empire in the 17th century. You know, or go to you know go to um, in the Roman Empire. You know, go to any number of different places um, or, or states of the past, um, and you'll find diversity on a on a scale which we couldn't even imagine. Um, and they had their own ways of dealing with it, and it was on the basis of substantive similarities, similarities of ways of life, similar attitude towards family life, and the fact that we all respect our own traditions and we can respect other people's traditions. It's not the denial of, of, the, of the differences. Actually, it's respect for those differences, while recognising that they are substantive, and therefore someone's got to be right at the end of the day, and someone's got to be wrong. Yes. So I'm saying, I'm going on and on like that. <laughs> no, <laughs> you, you've, you've, you've said it. <laughs> very, very beautifully, and you've said something extremely important and and brilliant, Joseph. Thank you. <laughs> but um, to go back to this 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 issue, it's 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 in a one sense they say, oh, it's generic spirituality, and it's what we've all got in common. But actually, if you get down to to brass tacks, you look at their books, you look at their spiritual techniques. Um, it's it's not. It's not equally Eastern, Western, Northern, Southern. It's, it, it does owe more to one tradition than to others. And that is the, um, broadly speaking, um, Eastern. Um, so that is to say, uh, Buddhist, um, Hindu, um, and a few other Eastern things thrown in. Eastern spirituality, um, the spirituality of um, dualism and the denial of dualism which is which is one of the funny things you get in in in, in india you get this debate which is kind of a debate within a debate um that there's there's um but but roger tell us more about this eastern spirituality yes yes um yes um i do see the new age as overwhelmingly eastern and possibly I would see it as more Eastern than some people. I think it has certain Western overlays that actually obscure um, the Eastern nat- nature of this. Um, I might just mention a book right now. It's called The Easternization of the West 
by a British academic called Colin Campbell. It's one of the very best um, books, I think, out there on the New Age. And he's really pointing out that the West is becoming Easternized. And he's all in favor of it. You know, um, he's just very much like Christianity is finished and done with, and we need these Eastern things. But this gets confusing to people. As I say, it's, in fact, there's, there's a Catholic author, um, Mitch Pacwa, who speaks about the New Age. He says something like this. It's a highly Americanized form of Hinduism. Right. Um, and that, I think this is the thing. The form can be Americanized or the form can be filled with psychobabble. But the content is more Eastern than we often realize. And this is really what I'm trying to say in my books. Um, and often I say things better in my books and I, I'm not a great ex extemporaneous speaker. <laughs> um, but I have a quote from one of my books here, The Gentle Traditionalist Returns. And yeah, that book, it's actually a novel. It has a character called The Gentle Traditionalist who's presenting the ideas and I'd actually like to quote something he says here, because I think he can say it better than me, um, about really, this is about the essence. It's not about the form. So I'm just going to read this part from my book. So the gentle traditionalist says, part of the problem is people don't see the essence here. They think Eastern means practicing yoga or Zen, but we're talking about something more subtle. Today, for instance, the Christian quest for salvation is increasingly replaced by the quest for enlightenment, mindfulness, or self-knowledge. Christian understanding of evil and sin is replaced by the Eastern notion of error and ignorance. And Christian love is replaced by monism, oneness. There's also a growing belief. Reality is illusory, like the Eastern concept of Maya. Syncretism is likewise more Eastern than Western. It's these ideas, non-Christian ideas, indeed pre-Christian ideas, that most concern me. The practices are less common. Most Westerners aren't about to start chanting the likes of Hare Krishna. Little do they realize their spirituality increasingly resembles that of the Orient. So, yeah, that, that's, you know, you brought up the film The Matrix. The, the Matrix is all about the idea that reality is illusory. This is a very Eastern idea. Um, you know, we're not living in a world of God's creation as a beautiful reality, we're living in this illusion. And so what I'm, I'm seeing and what academics like Colin Campbell with his Easternization of the West book are seeing is that these ideas, these subtle ideas are really taking over the world. Yes, yes. Well, one of the, one of the nice things about the Matrix um, in, in terms of its making clear what, what's going on is that, that the point of it is that it's not just that the real that the real world is, is, is an illusion. It's that it's that it's on the one hand, it's very difficult to ex for people to accept the real world's illusion. And on the other hand, if you really, really understand the real world's illusion, it gives you power. Yes, 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 absolutely. You fantastic, Joseph. You're, you're doing this better than I could myself. <laughs> <laughs> and it's, and it's, 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 it's what, what the chap does in the film is that he so completely frees himself from the illusion that he says, well, actually, this is all in my mind and therefore I can control it. Yes, 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 yes. I can fly. Yes. I can yes. let bullets go through me. And the only reason the bullets kill you is because you think that they're going to kill you. Yes. Yes. So it's, it's, um, well, it's fantastic. It's absolutely fantastic. Um, and um, it, it, it's, it's, because that's exactly, that's exactly it. You've just got to let it go. And then you kind of stand up a kind of spiritual giant. Um, and, um, and, and everything, everything kind of falls in your lap. <laughs> yes. 
So coming back to the question of the, the nature of, of the New Age phenomenon, one thing that, that strikes me is that, as we've said, it's, it has a, a, a sort of Eastern feel to it. But there are aspects of Eastern spirituality which it doesn't seem particularly in, interested in developing. Uh, for obviously, one example would be the Eastern devotion to tradition, um, Eastern asceticism, um, Eastern um, discipline, spiritual discipline. Uh, the New Age is, is if anything, um, you know, very undisciplined. Um, and that's, I mean, that's well, on the one hand, that needs explaining. Um, and one thing that occurs to me thinking about this is that this, the movement seems to have latched on to something which is perhaps independently present in the culture of the English speaking world, which is a suspicion of its own tradition. So famously, you have George Orwell saying of the intellectuals of Britain that they, unlike intellectuals in other countries, they hate their own country, which I think is an interesting, interesting observation. Um, in order to be you know, sophisticated in terms of, of food, you know, you've got to like non-British cooking, you know, in order to be uh, you know, a cosmopolitan, well, literally what, what, what cosmopolitan mean, you need to, you need to, you need to kind of absorb other, other cultures. Um, in order to be spiritual, you've got to go even further over, over overseas um, and go right, leap for right over the entire Western tradition and experience um, and adopt something from the East, except that those things which the East has in common with the West, uh, we can leave on one side because obviously there's nothing wrong with them because they, they can't be they can't be good because they're, 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 they we have them in the West as well, which is a bit of a strange thing to say, and no doubt they didn't put it quite like that to themselves. But it, the result of this is that the the New Age appears to us now as as a kind of left liberal kind of phenomenon. I mean, to speak in, in perhaps slightly unfortunate political terms, but uh, ones that, that are, are meaningful. Um, and it, 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 something which appeals, I think, to a kind of Protestant mentality, which has lost the Protestant faith, which is that the, 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 the genuine in the spiritual realm um, is something which can only be recovered if we destroy what, what we've inherited in our own cultural tradition, in the Western cultural tradition, you know, we've got to burn down those monasteries. We've got to, we've got to destroy those, those, those religious Im images. We've got to, we've got to reject, you know, scholasticism, you know, whatever it might be. Um, and, and start again. And it's, it's, it's iconoclastic. It's, I, it's, it's uh, anti-traditional. Um, and that's a, and you, you, well, you hear New Ages saying, um, well, you, you said this yourself, that, 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 that oh, we'll accept any religion, or, you know, all religions are wonderful, um, but somehow there's a kind of mental reservation there about Christianity and particularly about Roman Catholicism. On that note, we must conclude part one of this two-part discussion. In part two, we'll be back talking with Roger about the mostly hidden roots of the New Age movement in the work of Helena Blavatsky and her intellectual successor, Alice Bailey, the movement known as Theosophy. Roger will be talking about his time in one of the two or three most influential world centres of the New Age movement, the Findhorn community in Scotland, and we will be asking why the New Age movement is attractive, particularly in the English-speaking world. This podcast was brought to you by the Latin Mass Society. We hope you enjoyed it and would appreciate your rating a podcast on the platform you are using. You'll find some more information and links relating to the talk in the show notes, which you can see on a page dedicated to the IOTA Una podcast series on our website. The Latin Mass Society promotes the celebration of the ancient Latin liturgy of the Catholic Church in England and Wales, organising masses and training events and defending and explaining the liturgical tradition in the context of the Catholic liturgy and thought. If you would like to find out more, do visit our website and consider joining us or giving us a donation. You'll find a big red donate button in the top right hand corner. Thank you.